So I'm Ryan Sorama from Commerce Guys. Um, it's a Drupal e-commerce based company that I started six years ago um, with some friends. And uh, we don't use Slim at all for work. Um, but whenever Josh came down a couple months ago, I was like, oh, this is interesting and new. Um, I want to learn more because all of my experience with PHP um, has been limited really to Drupal. Um, a little bit of OS Commerce before that, but mostly Drupal 7, if you consider Drupal 7 came out, I think, in 2011. And so I've been working on it since 2010. So five years now of Drupal development at PHP 5.2 levels of like language support. And so I don't know if anybody's familiar, but modern PHP is actually much more powerful. Um, and you can develop applications much faster, uh, much more simply, and you actually have actual object-oriented programming support in the language now as of really PHP 5.3 at least with namespaces and so on. Anyway, so, so whenever Josh came down and talked to us about Slim, it's like, oh, this is an opportunity for me to learn something new that's still not very mature because um, 3.x is the current development version of the framework. It's not fully, like, fully released yet. Um, but it, it would be an avenue for me to learn how to do PHP the right way since the guy who created Slim also happened to start a whole movement called PHP the right way. Um, you can find that at phptherightway.com or you can read more about it in his book that he published through O'Reilly called Modern PHP. And so, so learning Slim um, was, was really an opportunity for me to learn more about modern PHP development. And that was essential because Drupal 8 is coming out soon and my company is already developing on it. And, um, and that means I need to up my game. And so I kind of honed in on um, middleware development um, because that was a new concept and it was interesting. So I, I honed in on middleware development. That's what today's talk is about. And I'm going to kind of set the stage for where you might use middleware first. And then we'll talk through how I actually developed it and how you can go and do likewise. All right, so live example time. We'll see if this actually works. All right, it will start by not working with Alt Tab. Not my machine. Uh, let's just no excuses. go down here. <laughs> oh, not it. Uh, there, there we go. Sorry, Ryan. We'll edit that out of the recording. <laughs> oh, man. Um, so I don't know if... Yeah, okay. Jiminy Christmas. Son. All right, we have increased the boom volume <laughs> instead of zoomed. Um, so you can't really see this. Let me see if I can zoom in. It's just command, it's, it is command plus. This is where the, the see no evil, speak no evil, hear no evil comes from. Live demos always go wrong. Um, so what we're looking at is really just a REST client for a website that I've launched on platform.sh uh, that, you know, how does this, okay. <laughs> that simply displays hello world. This is a slim application that the, the root of the, um, of the application simply says hello world. Um, and so if you're building a website, obviously you're returning HTML or just text or whatever in the browser interprets it however it wants to. Um, but if you're building an API, um, you may want to return something that's a bit more structured and useful to a client, such as JSON. Um, so I have a little route here that's just called slash JSON. And it's going to return the same exact message, but just in kind of a, a pseudo you know, JSON format that maybe some client or JavaScript front-end framework could interpret and translate into the message that's supposed to be displayed at this page. Um, but it's not, it's not just that you might want to create uh, a, a site that has an API behind it that can return JSON, but you might have one that does like one or the other. So if I access a user's profile page, I can return an HTML representation of that user to a browser, but a client might request that same data in JSON and, and get different, uh, a different response as a result. So I have another route here called HTML or JSON. All right. It's actually called JSON or HTML. <laughs> um, and, and this page, because I'm requesting it through the browser, um, is returning HTML first. Um, but if I had a client that requested that same data, so let's just copy this uh, URL here, requested that same data in uh, uh, application JSON. Um, so it's the same exact URL, but I'm requesting it in a different content format or media type hit send, and I end up getting back that information in a little JSON object. Um, so this is, this is what's kind of called content negotiation, reading the headers of an HTTP request to determine what kind of response is my client expecting. HTML versus JSON versus XML, or maybe some subtype like collection plus JSON or how plus JSON or something like that. And you can see there, my, my request header tells it what kind of 
data should it return, and my response tells it what kind of format it returned, and everything is working just fine. And the way that I did this in Slim is using middleware. So let me you know, go back to the slides and talk about what Slim is, what it provides, and what middleware is, and how it was useful for this particular task. <coughs> All right. Um, so actually, first to dial it back just a little bit, um, one, one thing to know about modern PHP that, that was uh, maybe not, uh, not self-evident to me was that modern PHP uses interoperable libraries. And really, they're, they're seeking interoperability that transcends the framework level. So modern PHP and, and developers will say, what we want is one piece of code that can run in a Symfony application, can run in a Laravel application, can run in a Slim application, or any sort of application that sort of conforms to a set of recommended standards, and that's what PSRs are. You've probably heard that term bandied about, PSR zero compliant, or PSR seven request object, or whatever. What PSRs are is just a set of independent standards um, that, that suggest how you might develop an application that um, you know, supports good class auto-loading, if you're used to object-oriented programming, or maybe uses some sort of abstract logging interface, or HTTP request or response interface. That's what these standards are for, and, and I actually made the mistake early on of, of thinking these were like successive levels of compliance. So you were a PSR something application. I was PSR 3, so that means I conformed to PSR 0, 1, 2, and 3. Um, and, and I thought that just because I was coming from a, uh, the REST world where the, the maturity model for REST APIs is a successive level um, of compliance that you're, you're attaining. Um, but with PSRs, they're really just independent standards. And the only reason I was confused is because PSR 4 and PSR 0 really deal with the same thing which is auto-loading PHP files whenever you try to create an object of a particular class. Um, but the standards also address coding standards. Um, like I said, they address application logging, and they address request and response um, objects. So how, how can you model an HTTP request and response and write code against this interface that can then be used in a different application or a different framework or whatever? And so Slim is really my introduction to how these things all fit together in one application framework. <coughs> so Slim uses PSR4 um, for organizing its code and determining how class files will be included and loaded in the application. It uses PSR2 at least for code formatting, and I assume it also uses um, PSR1 for code style as well. Um, I don't believe it uses PSR3, which is that logging interface, but it also uses PSR7 for its request and response objects. And, and the reason that's important is because um, any code now written against that PSR spec that only uses the functions on this request object um, that conform to that interface can also be used inside of a Slim application. And so that, that gives you the tools to start to write interoperable code. So I can write code for Slim that I can also use in other frameworks or just in my standalone applications. Um, so the Slim approach is to quickly define an application with all of its routes, and we saw Josh do this a couple months ago. Um, it's to match incoming requests to routes that generate responses um, using those PSR7 objects. So a route would be that, you know, slash is the home page route, or slash JSON is my JSON route, slash JSON or HTML is that route, etc. cetera. Um, and then it has application and route level middleware, um, which is really um, in, in, in uh, uh, oh shoot, what's it called, a design, in design pattern speak, it's, it's creating a chain of command or a chain of responsibility that, that governs what code gets, gets called when in the life cycle of responding to an HTTP request. Um, so it's, what it is is for either at the application level or at the route level, you're creating the stack of information or layers around the callback that finally determines what gets displayed to the end user. Um, and, and these layers are processed on the way in and on the way out. And I have a little graphic that shows what that looks like. Um, but, but at its most basic, this is a slim application. Um, it, it instantiates my application object. It defines a route that returns some sort of response, and then it runs, which just means it, it gets the request, it creates the request object, and then it matches it to a particular route, and then you know fires away. And of course, the response, if I use PHP just to start that up at my local host, will be that hello world that we saw also in my, my live example. Um, now, to, to demonstrate middleware, you can simply, in this case, we're going to use the application level middleware um, to put before and after around that hello world message. Um, and so the idea here is that this is defining my route, but I'm saying at the application level that before we ever get to the route, we're going to invoke this function first. And then we'll invoke the actual route callback. 
And then on the way back out, we'll have a chance to come out through the middleware as well. And so you can see it kind of comes in, the response gets before added to it, um, then we pass it on to the next, you know, uh, callable or the next function stack, which happens to be my route callback. And then on the way back through, um, we get a chance to execute more code before finally returning the response to the client. And so that, you know, ends up looking like this, which is, I didn't have a chance to blow that up, sorry. Um, but you can see it's, it's before, hello, after in my simple middleware demonstration. And so let's take just a second to understand what um, a, a middleware is. Um, so is anybody familiar with the, the concept of a callable in PHP? Is that familiar at all? It's, it's basically anything in PHP that you can invoke, that you can call. That's why it's like a callable. Um, and so um, it could be a function name. You, you might have seen the pattern of putting a function name in a string, and then you can use that string, uh, that, that variable, to execute that function. Is that familiar? And uh, Drupal does this, and I think WordPress would do it as well for like hook invocation. Um, but it could also be an object. Um, it could be a, an actual like class that has an, a magic method that's just called invoke. And so you can actually invoke the whole class as if it itself is a callable. Um, or it could be a specific method on a class. So say you have like a class that defines a static method or something, you could invoke it directly as a callable. So any one of these things, or, or I think, I can't remember when closures were added to PHP, it was 5.3 or 5.4. But at least since that time as well, you can actually define a function as a variable, and that can be callable as well, um, which is very similar to JavaScript, if you're familiar. Um, <coughs> so the idea is that a middleware is just anything that's callable that you either add to the application or the route level stack that has a common signature, which in Slim includes a PSR7 request object, response object, and then just some kind of a callable. And Slim sort of manages making a stack out of these things and then executing through the call stack. Um, you just sort of have to, have to remember that you have to use that signature and that at the end of the day, it must return a response object. And you may invoke um, the next callable in the stack, which is what that, that next argument is for. Um, and if you want to, you can execute more code after doing so. So all of these things together create a chain uh, whereby like a request comes in and I've built up middleware around my application callback uh, or my in this case would actually end up resolving to a route and calling that and, and at each layer I can do something different and if I want to I can either go ahead and return a response immediately so let's say that I'm trying to um, figure out what my session is but the session has an expired session key or something like that an expired session ID well maybe I just go ahead and return some kind of an error there or more, more realistically I just wouldn't like load a user account or something for that current request. But then let's say there was authentication and the user failed to authenticate for the action they were trying to take. Then I could go ahead and return like a 403 or something like that. Same if I was using a middleware to do access control, um, I could return a 403. Or if I was just trying to find, you know, some sort of resource like a, um, you know, page slash five, but I detect that, you know, page five doesn't exist, then I can easily return a 404. And there are other things that you can do with these layers of middleware because you're, you're really just saying that every request that comes into my application must go through these steps. One, I'll go ahead and see what's in the session. Then I'll authenticate that user. Then I'll do access control. Maybe I'll see if I should serve up a response from the cache. If, if uh, well, before that I might do content negotiation. Okay, what media type should I be formatting my response in? So that by the time I get down to the root level of the application, um, I have all the information I need to process this request and create a response object. And then, on the way out, that response can again be sort of further manipulated. So if on the way in, when I get to my cache layer, um, I don't find any, any uh, pre-existing response for this route in the cache, but it can be cached, well then on the way out, once I have my response, I might want to go ahead and save that in the cache then. Um, that would be an example of what you might do on the way out. Um, I, I actually, ah, never mind. I was going to say, I, I thought for a while that I could do something, then I realized I couldn't, but that's a red herring. Um, so the question is, where do I go to find pre-existing middleware if I don't want to have to write them myself? And the answer to that is that modern PHP uses Composer, um, which is a dependency management tool, and it's tied into Packagist, which is um, basically a, a library online of all of these standalone PHP libraries and tools, such as Slim, um, that you can easily pull into your local environment to begin developing with. Um, it also has excellent built-in support for, or GitHub has excellent built-in support for Packagist. 
so that all I had to do to publish my own middleware on packages was create a GitHub repo, put my code up in there, go to the settings for the repository, put in my, my little API key for, for packages, and suddenly I was published on packages and somebody could install um, this middleware library alongside of um, Slim just by using composer require and then the name of the library and the version to get. Um, so there will be other middleware up there for Slim 3.x. Right now you could find middleware for Slim 2.x, but since 3.x is still so new, I think this might be the first unless they've, they've gone on to upgrade some of the core like Slim middleware packages. Um, but the idea is um, for your project, um, you can either type composer require and then the name of the package from the command line, or you can manage your composer.json file to instruct you know, composer, you know, what are the requirements of the dependencies for my current project that I'm building. So if you add a new library to this and then type composer update, it's gonna go ahead and fetch all the code and all of its dependencies and everything that you need. Like for example, my library depends on Will Durand slash negotiation, so that gets pulled in automatically as well. Um, and you'd be able to see all of this in your project's vendor directory. Um, so, so once I have that, adding middleware to a callback um, is, is or to a route um, is as simple as using the add method on the route object itself. So the, the first example that we saw added um, some middleware to the application. In this case, I'm actually adding it to this particular get route. And this is looking back at that, that JSON route that we had. So the idea is at slash JSON, I'm going to return just kind of a random JSON object. Um, but before we do that, I want to add a layer to my middleware stack that, that um, calls the negotiator object to ensure that the request is expecting application JSON. And the idea is if somebody tried to use my API and request XML, um, the appropriate response is for me to say, I, I can't return XML, which is an HTTP 406 response. Um, it's a not acceptable um, uh, content type or whatever. Um, and so this, this middleware that I wrote will do just that. And I can't remember which slide is next. Eh, yeah, so there's the response, which we already saw. Um, the code's gonna be too small, and I'm not gonna try to go back to Chrome and show all the Ryan secrets again. Um, but the idea is that, that what my class does, and if you look at the code here, is it accepts a, an array as an argument, and that array um, is the various types of uh, media types that will be acceptable for this route, or if I was doing it at the application level for the whole application. So I pass in an array of priorities. You see that here in the, app, in the, um, the middleware's constructor, and that information gets stored in these little protected properties in the class. And then I also go through the, uh, the task of setting up the negotiation library to do the actual content type negotiation. Um, and then the magic happens whenever Slim is going through its call stack, it will invoke the callable, and, and that ends up in, uh, calling this magic method in PHP, which is just an invoke method on the class that has the signature that we were looking for. So the PSR7 server request interface, the response interface object, and then off the screen is the callable, which is called next. And so it's, it's a really small like bit of code that gets executed here. It's not, it's not a very complex library. Um, we negotiate the media type, which will end up storing on the object itself what the, uh, what the matching media type was for the, the, the given accept header. Um, if I can't find one, then we return immediately a 406 response, and so nothing else ever happens in the application. So if I have uh, additional layers that we're doing authentication and access control and all that stuff, that could be expensive operations because they might be hitting the database to determine if this user has access to do that operation. I can go ahead and bail out early if somebody's trying to, to hit my API with an unacceptable media type. Um, but if it does work, then I go ahead and store the media type object in the request object itself. And so this is actually where it's kind of important that we use the server request interface because in the PSR7 standards you have just a request interface but then a server request interface that's supposed to model an HTTP request to like a, a web server. So it has session information and cookie information and other things like that. Um, and this is the object that Slim internally uses. Um, it, it, it extends request interface, um, but what actually ends up getting passed through the Slim middleware stack is a server request object. And so we're able to use a, um, an attribute like storage mechanism on that object to save the media type um, that, that we believe should be returned in the response on the request object itself. 
And we're doing that because then each successive layer of the application can now refer back to that negotiated media type. Um, so if this was um, you know, trying to authenticate a user, I might store in the request attributes variable um, the, the user object that was just authenticated, or at least the user ID, or something that, that a subsequent layer might use then to do access control, and then maybe you know, format the response based on my user settings or something like that. Um, and then at the end of it all, I just sort of call the, call the, next, um, the next layer of the stack and I just kind of return that immediately because I know that eventually this is going to end up returning a response object. Um, so that um, is ultimately what results in you know, us getting our JSON response. And um, just to come back a sec to the code example, you can see here that at my route, I'm actually making use of this media type attribute that I had previously stored in the request object. Um, and so what happens is we said it's, it's layers, right? So I have my my route callback at the very center, and then I'm adding layers of middleware around it, so the inner layers can take advantage of anything that this layer does to manipulate the request or the response object. Um, and, th and that's why you also know that um, if, if a previous layer had already written something to the response body, I could inspect that now and do something with it as well, um, so to cache a response on the way out or something like that. Um, so let's talk about um, where, where content integration might actually come into play. And like I said, you might have a site that also has an API that uses the same URL structure to return both um, an HTML representation of um, a user account or a page or something, some data point to a browser, um, but to uh, somebody that, that's wanting to use that as like a JSON API might return something different at the same URL. I can use accept header based content negotiation to do that if I want to. Although there are reasons not to, such as you know using big content delivery networks that don't know how to um, cache data based on accept headers. Um, but if if this fit our use case, um, what is going on here? Um, I could um, add my negotiator and specify that it that it will accept either text HTML or application JSON, and then I have an additional property which you could read about in the negotiator classes documentation that says, hey, if if, a, if an accept header is missing, just go ahead and use um, text HTML as the media type. So I don't really care if, if somebody doesn't properly request HTML, I'm always going to return HTML. Um, and then if they do specifically request application JSON, then I will return that. And so this is what, what happened with that route, where we returned one or the other. Um, I do my negotiation first, and then in the route callback, I'm able to get the media type, and then, based on um, the media type's value, either HTML or JSON, um, I've already loaded my data, so load the user account from the database, and then I'm just formatting it in two different ways. Um, and you know, at, at a bigger level, like your application would probably use a different view or something to return different types of data, but this is just a real quick, simple example um, that will be in the slides posted online. Is there a question, or I'm just seeing things? Um, so this is where we had the example of it looking like either a formatted user page or um, when I requested specifically application JSON, then I got JSON back. Um, and then to, to sort of make it more explicit what you can do with middleware, um, in this case I've actually just used a closure. So instead of calling a class or calling some pre-existing function, um, I'm just doing it inline. So I have a, a function that has that same request, response, and next callable signature. And um, it can do the same thing that like part of my, um, my route callback was doing previously. So um, whereas before I was um, adding the, the appropriate content type header to my response object inside the route callback itself, here I'm showing that I could, if I wanted to, create a, yet another middleware that was responsible for translating that um, uh, the negotiated media type into a header on the response object. And, and realistically, that there, there's an argument to be made that that could be handled in the negotiation middleware itself. I'm not sure if, if I should do that or not. So if anybody has any opinions on that, feel free to let me know. Um, at the end of the day, oh, sorry, final thing is that you also, as we said earlier, can add the same middleware to the application level. So in this case, um, my, my middleware is just doing content negotiation. If the whole application should only accept JSON, there's no reason for me to add JSON you know, verification at the route level. I could just do it at the ap application level and return that for our six before we ever even get down to matching the route itself. Um, 
so you could do you know authentication at the application level or whatever else that you're trying to do there. Um, but at the end of the day, like all of this for me is 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 really just about learning and adopting improvements in the PHP language, learning new bits of like the PHP ecosystem, like packages and Composer. Coming from the Drupal world, those were really new for me. Um, Drupal 8 will actually use Composer now and will have its modules up on packages if you wanted to build a Drupal site that way. Um, but all I knew was Drush, which was a Drupal specific tool. Now I have access to a, a much bigger ecosystem of tools. And I'm also beginning to learn um, just, just different design patterns and design principles, such as what is middleware? And I, I, I've briefly been exposed to it through um, just JavaScript application development, because um, this is modeled after Express.js, which uses a very similar concept. It's also modeled after a Ruby framework, I think, called Sonata. Um, not a, what's that? Sorry, Sinatra, not Sonata. It's not as an e-commerce framework. Um, and so this is really making me a better like PHP and Drupal developer even now, even if I don't have an actual like practical use case for this yet. Now, I do have a couple of APIs that I hope to build using Slim, and I hope to build them using middleware that I've write, written and published to packages and hopefully collaborated on some of you with. Um, but in the meantime, like it really is making me a better Drupal developer as well. And the example that I just gave at Drupal Camp Asheville was that I had a project that was just an API integration project, and rather than encode all of the API communication um, code in the module file itself, I was like, oh, why don't I just make like a standalone library that communicates with the API and conforms to the PSR4 standard and PSR2 and blah, blah, blah. Because then my client gets something that actually was faster for me to develop rather than making it very idiosyncratic to Drupal. Um, and now more widely usable you know, by the broader PHP community. And then all my module has to do is just instantiate, instantiate that, like, that class as an object for communicating with the API. Um, so like th they had estimated 80 hours for the task. I was able to get it done in about 40, which is good for them, maybe not so much for my, my fair change. Um, but you know, this has had, like even just learning Slim since we heard about it from Josh. Like, I'd never heard of Slim before Josh came down two months ago. And now sort of learning all this stuff and having fun and, and learning new things resulted in me being a better freelancer and hopefully being a better developer for my, my day job as well. Um, so if there are any questions, I'm happy to field those. Um, if not, I'm also happy to cede the floor. Jim? Is Slim allow itself to be a client as well, where you can flip those objects around and you can use it to request something and then deal with the response that comes back? Um, I, I don't think you need Slim for that. I think you could just use like Guzzle. Have you used that yet? It's just a standalone um, HTTP request library, and that actually replaces in Drupal the whole Drupal HTTP request API. Um, so I think you would use something like that. Um, so I don't think Slim would really give you much. So it's, it's meant to be a server. Yeah. 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 Definitely. As far as I know, I could be wrong. <laughs> um, yeah. What was that um, Chrome extension you know, What's awesome, right? Yeah, it was just uh, advanced rest. Do you mind if I cruise back over and try to reveal your secrets? There we go. I can't. Really advan it's just the ad advanced rest client. Okay. Yeah. Um, I I honestly just like googled Chrome rest client and this is what came up. Oh, so, so yeah. Postman. Cool, yeah. yeah. Which one? Postman. 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 Come on. Yeah. Man, I understand <laughs> 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 From a broad philosophical standpoint, if you were starting to do PHP today, would you do PHP or would you continue to do Drupal? Yeah, if I'm, if right. like, are, are we assuming I have like programming experience yeah. already? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, let's say that. Yeah, because I mean, it's it's true that like I, I've been doing Drupal development for ten years. And most of what I know about application development has come from being a part of that community and being mentored by people in that community. So there's been real advantages, even though it's sort of lagging behind the language. There have been real advantages to being a part of that community. So I suppose like there there is like a more abstract PHP community that you could be a part of now. And it there's a pretty active Reddit, like subreddit for PHP. And there are people that are trying to sort of push forward sort of interoperable abstract PHP library development. Um, but you could probably find the help and support you need without being a part of like a WordPress or a Drupal community. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure if I would have started from scratch just because 
Um, like even now, like, like I'm, I'm having to, to learn so much about like user authentication, security, session management, and all this stuff that I got for free just by using Drupal. Um, so I, I might be tempted to say I'd start with like a Symfony or something that was more of a full stack framework, um, or a Laravel, which is also like a kind of easy to get into framework. Um, but I'm not sure. I, I probably start at WordPress if I'm <laughs> if, if I'm the if I'm the, the typical PHP developer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if, if I can jump into that for a second. Yeah. It's, uh, it's funny to see online where you know, I would go to PHP because you, you can easily get one to be a Google developer or a WordPress developer, not a PHP developer or a software engineer or whatever. You're locked into whatever you like. Yeah, for a long time, I thought it was PHP, but I was coding my own for like three years. So I was coding my own And so when I'm learning, And, and that my goal really is to like write it once and see it run anywhere. Like, there's no reason that a Laravel application couldn't use this yeah, if there's it. A, there's a compiler for uh, Cobol for JavaScript. Now, so you can just do just do all every all your stuff into Cobol. And eventually, someone will write a compiler. Well, there's also PHP JS if you're curious. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Jim, uh, oh, never mind. <laughs> Something new? So I can see you saying you can add uh, middleware onto all requests or an individual route. Um, you see that getting pretty messy. Does Splitman have some kind of like containerization where it's like, you know, if you're going to do these same 10 things, you know, you're going to do sessions and authentication and you're going to uh, make sure that the content type's right, you're going to validate it, that you know, JSON, valid JSON, like rather than attaching those same five or 10 things to every route. Does it have a way where you just like dump in, you know, kind of like these are my standard request middleware? Yeah, at the top of my it. head, I'm not. I don't. I don't know. Uh, I mean, like you. Could, yeah, you could use if if it works for your application, you could use the application level middleware and just do it once, and then it basically what it does is all of your application middleware are coming in first, and then the application resolves the route, and then you have your route middleware, and then finally the route callback. So you could just do it once at the app level if. You can do it at the app level. Yeah. Now, if you still had a mixture, maybe more of like yeah. if you did each of the same, say, four things on, on every, on yeah. like five of those fifteen routes, would yeah. you want to like go two big four? Yeah, yeah. Big four, <laughs> big four, or just do yeah, like I'd have to, I'd have to look at the route object. Onto the route. Yeah. 
the the route class might have some more info on that. Uh, but I'm not sure. Kind of a, another question. Just think of like in Drupal, you're saying like call holes is basically like Drupal hooks, right? So like when you when you add a new module in Drupal, like when you enable a module in Drupal Bootstrap itself, it basically goes through and says like, okay, let everybody that's enabled have a chance to say something. Mm -hmm. But this is kind of undoing some of that, where it's like, well, don't don't go and like bootstrap everything up, and then everybody's there. You find out here, yeah. This is like only bootstrap, and then only do the things that you need to do. Yeah. And if you actually, you know, before you even get down to, to bootstrapping all of the things you could do, you got to bounce out. Yeah. So that's probably why you. It's a lot more explicit, yeah. It's like, you know, you're not you're not bootstrapping up an application. You're basically just going very serial. Yeah. You know, I'm not sure if it's been benchmarked. I mean, Slim 3.x is super new, yeah. so that wouldn't have any benchmarks. But yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, all I know is it's going to be loads faster than a full Drupal load. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. Thinking about it, I mean, a, a route. Um, so a, a route is really just a, um, an HTTP method, a URL pattern, and then a callable. Even though I'm defining my inline using closures, it could be a class um, that that is invoked. And so I, I I wonder. I'd have to play around with it to see. But I wonder if you could use like the constructor of a route class to add a um, like a, a known chain of middleware or something like that. It's then every route that had the same pattern could just inherit that. But I'd have to, to look and see. This I was not having to touch my figure, like, oh, it's just like this another slim, like a really lightweight framework. But it kind of sounds like it's not really a framework, it's really just uh, like a router. Structure. Yeah, it's yeah, a yeah structure exactly. what you want a route to do. Yeah. It's a very serial path. And, you know, whereas a Laravel and a Drupal type of system, they really, there's a bootstrap file and it goes like, Call everything that wants to be possibly called, and then go start doing stuff. Mm -hmm. Then go to your routes, and then start doing stuff. Mm -hmm. This is going. Don't even bootstrap anything. Just go directly into the route. Yeah. Don't even touch the database unless you actually need to at your you know, yeah. final destination. So, like one example, and I, I heard this example at um, Symphony Live last year. Um, it's using Drupal as a, a content um, man. Well, using it purely as a CMS just for the back end of Uyala, which is a, a video platform, um, to, to enter in metadata about their videos. Uh, and then the um, Uyala wanted to have an API, then a REST API that could serve up that metadata. It's purely read-only. And so they took Drupal and they just um, sort of indexed all of the metadata into a solar um, database. And then they created separately um, a Silex application, which is kind of like Symphony's Slim. Um, that was just reading data directly from the solar database. And so you end up with, with two applications sitting side by side, one that handles actually creating and managing content, and then one that's just a slim, lightweight API that's just fetching data out and returning it in its you know, simplest form. Um, and that's where you can start to like put multiple applications together to solve you know, a set of problems. You could use WordPress as just a you know, content authoring platform and then, you know, interact with that database directly via Slim app or something um, similar. Well, Drupal does too. But if you don't want to have to go through the whole bootstrap process, um, you can avoid it. Drupal 8 just puts a couple buttons and voila, you got like HAL JSON and 
Yeah, a whole rest API with how JSON. Alright, I'll wrap up my time. I don't know if there's anything else going on.